purging professors from the classroom who offer different worldviews. Next on Campus Roundup. Hello, I'm Dr. Duke, and this is the Campus Roundup at the College Fix. Our top story segment this week focuses on universities getting rid of very popular professors simply because they challenge their students. To talk more about this, we welcome Diamond Braxton, a creative writing major at the University of Houston and a journalist at the College Fix. Diamond, welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you so much. You wrote a really interesting article. We have Duke University. Is it my imagination or does Duke University seem to end up in our campus roundup segments, our, our critical segments, a lot? There's a lot going on at Duke. Uh, tell us a little bit about this story and how you came to it. Okay, so my editor, Greg Piper, uh, showed me this story and told me to look into it because this professor named Evan Charney, who is a public policy professor at Duke, wasn't going to have his contract renewed for the next following semester. And because of that, it was some of his students said that his class was an unsafe space. And so I was able to talk to several of the students and ended up getting a completely different narrative. And so that's that's what was going on at Duke. What, according to these uh, complaining students, I'm sure, were you able to talk to the complaining students, number one? And number two, what was the nature of their complaint against Professor Charney? So I wasn't able to talk to the complaining students, but my understanding is that in one of his classes, um, he kind of takes a devil's advocate approach on certain issues, sensitive issues. And I know that there was like a week long sit in at Duke University when an executive vice president got into an accident with someone on campus and used a racial slur against her. And so in result of that, there were about 10 or so students that had to sit in on campus and demanded like a $15 minimum wage. And they also wanted that that executive president to resign. And so um, Charney brought this issue up in his class and he wanted his students to kind of voice their opinions and choose a side on the subject. And so this made some of the protesters uncomfortable in the class and said that it was an unsafe space since they had to like protect their, uh, like justify their actions. It's amazing to me that there's a racial incident on campus. We need an out, uh, a m much higher minimum wage on campus. We need mm -hmm. uh, some, somebody says something that offends somebody. That immediately means we need better student insurance for graduate students. So I, it's amazing how uh, the slightest provocation is an opportunity for um, very opportunistic left-wing radicals on college campus to start demanding the moon, throwing everything at the wall and <laughs> see what will stick. For you trying to research a story like this, uh, you almost had to know going in, right, that the university wasn't going to talk to you at all. So how do you, how do you try to maintain balance? How do you research and, and write a story like this when you know you're not going to get anything at all from the people who, who perhaps have the most to lose? Right. So I tried to get in contact with the Sanford School of Public Policy, which Evan Charney works for, and um, Kelly Brunell wasn't able, he didn't answer my phone calls or my emails, I still haven't heard from him. And then my next step was to get in contact with Duke Media Relations, and someone did, a spokesperson did answer, but they said that they never talk about personnel issues. He still said he tried to get in contact with the Sanford School of Public Policy for me, but I never heard back from him either. Um, so my next step, there was a petition where about 100 students signed to have Charney come back on as a professor. And so I tried to get in contact with about 20 of the people that signed the petition, and I got in contact with two of them, um, a girl named Hannah, who's already graduated Duke and currently works for a congressman now, and then another girl named Ziki, who is an international student who's supposed to be graduating Duke next year. So, in other words, you had to really, very limited access to the people involved in this and the university, of course. Did the university ever give a formal reason why they were decided they were not going to renew Professor Charney's contract? Not that I know of. So, all of a sudden, he's been teaching there for a number of years, he's been renewed no problem, and then boom, there's a few complaints and he's not renewed anymore, and the university won't talk about it. Exactly. It was interesting, though, with um, Ziki, when I was talking to her, she did mention that when she would see Charney like in the public policy building, he was always by himself. And she kind of mentioned that he didn't care about the hierarchy within the school and he really didn't care about titles and he didn't have a good relationship with the other professors, but he genuinely cared about his students. And so she kind of mentioned that maybe there's something we don't know going on, uh, but we really don't know. There, There's no... Thanks. Well, the thing we do know for sure is that in the classroom, Professor Charney was committed to critical thinking, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Entertaining all sorts of ideas, willing to push people's comfort level so that they had a higher understanding. That seems to be a really vanishing art now, doesn't it, on college campuses? Oh, yeah. Um 
for when I was talking to these students, I wanted to take this class. It's very rare for a professor to take on a devil's advocate approach, especially on issues like euthanasia, to bring in sex workers and to talk about issues where, I mean, these students are in public policy classes. This is what they're studying and it's going to be aggressive when they graduate. And so for him to do this is to help them prepare for these conversations that they're going to have in the future. But it is rare to see a professor do to, to do that. And so I think that's why it made some students feel uncomfortable, but it wasn't an unsafe space. Well, that's a, an amazing point you bring up. I'm glad you said that, that these are kids who are going to enter public policy careers. These are kids who are going to be taking positions and advocacy and, and joining government at all levels, whose job it is to uh, influence policy. And these mm -hmm. kids already, before they've even gotten their undergraduate degree, will not listen, will not even entertain the possibility of hearing two sides to a story. That doesn't bode well for the future of the republic, does it? Exactly. To read more stories like Diamond's, please follow The College Fix on Twitter and Facebook. Diamond Braxton, thank you so much for your time today and for your articulate explanation of what went on. Time now for Talking Campus, our weekly discussion with members of the College Fix editorial team. Today, I'm joined by College Fix associate editor Greg Piper for a continuing conversation about professors being in disinvited from the classroom for daring to be a little bit different, for promoting critical thinking. Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about what's going on with Duke. We saw what happened to uh, Professor Charney at Duke, but you also wrote a really interesting article about uh, Professor Griffiths in the Religious Studies program, and tell us his story. Uh, sure, he, he's a very veteran professor, has a 30-year academic career, uh, seems to have a really good reputation with students, but his problem is with other faculty. Uh, he uh, had responded to an email from a, a diversity official uh, at Duke Divinity uh, who was inviting faculty to a voluntary diversity training, and uh, it, this is kind of the last straw for him. He has seen what these trainings do, that they aren't particularly helpful, that they waste very valuable time for these faculty, and he, he basically said, you're not going to get anything out of this. I highly recommend that you avoid it. Um, and, uh, and for that, he was investigated. Uh, he was brought up on, uh, on harassment charges, on unprofessional conduct charges. Uh, it, it was really uh, administrators trying to let him know you are not allowed to voice a disagreement here with uh, part of our bureaucracy. And uh, he pretty much just gave up. He uh, formally resigned just at the end of the semester. Um, and it's, it's kind of a sad story for him. He had this wonderful career and it pretty much ended because he offended someone who was, uh, you know, trying to push more diversity on the faculty. I am absolutely blown away, not surprised, but blown away that they accused him of harassment, bullying colleagues, this kind of garbage. And, and to be very blunt with you, as somebody who's been at universities for 25 years, these things are a waste of time. And they're a waste of time because it is progressive liberals lecturing other woke progressive liberals about how bad it is to not be uh, in the mainstream. There's nothing that these professors are telling each other at great cost and great expense and great time wasting and great, great fanfare. What they're telling themselves is what they've already predicated the university on. Now, they would mean something, I think, Greg, if these so-called diversity initiatives actually compelled liberal college professors to consider intellectual diversity, they might have some value. That's the only kind of diversity that college professors aren't preaching. It's the one they need a lesson on. Alas, they never get that. I think that's right. Uh, it's probably the one that uh, professors would fight the hardest against if this were actually part of their training. Uh, one of the interesting things that Paul Griffith said uh, just earlier this year at a conference was uh, that uh, with all this kind of harassment and, uh, and bullying over diversity, you're seeing a lot less uh, professors actually willing to uh, share divergent opinions. They're pretty much self-censoring now, and you're reaching a point in the academy where uh, you're, you're going to have trouble actually getting people to promote uh, robust, rigorous debate because they're afraid what's going to happen uh, from a bureaucratic perspective. Uh, if uh, if uh, the university will go after their tenure, uh, will it even be worth holding on to their tenure? Uh, there's a professor at Cal State who uh, went through this a couple years ago, uh, Robert Oscar Lopez, who decided it wasn't worth keeping his tenure because he had become such a pariah on campus. He said uh, students were filing frivolous complaints against him. Uh, faculty were, were actually planting students is what he thought they were doing to file complaints against him. Uh, pretty much just because he's socially conservative and he offered an extra credit assignment to go to a family conference. And uh, anything that promotes the traditional family, I think, is is really kind of off limits if you're a professor, even if you're offering any other extra credit assignment. Um, and so that was kind of the canary in the coal mine uh, within the past few years. And uh, it's really ripening now with Evan Charney and uh, Paul Griffiths. 
And Professor Lopez, and correct me if I'm wrong, not only is he a minority, he's Hispanic, he's also gay, is that correct? Uh, he identifies as bisexual. He is Latino. Uh, he he really fits what you think would be kind of popular boxes among faculty, but he's socially conservative. He uh, he is intentionally chaste, a Southern Baptist, and uh, and and so he has this kind of identity that really doesn't work for anyone. Um, and uh, nobody could really go after him for uh, what he, what he's doing in the classroom. It's just these kind of uh, microaggressive comments that he's alleged to be doing. And, uh, and he decided after a while, this is really not worth my time. Even if I emerge unscathed, I'm going to be under siege the entire time I'm here. Well, and that absolutely validates, doesn't it, Professor, Professor Griffith's point, that here you have somebody who checks a number of diversity boxes who is radically, radically unique on a college campus, besides all of the superficial kinds of diversity, right, sexuality, race, sexual characteristics, that kind of thing. He also happens to be a unique conservative voice in a sea of liberal voices, and and. That, that kind of diversity, it, nobody else can claim they, I can think of another university that has somebody like him, and yet he's driven from his position despite checking all the boxes because when it comes down to it, what we want is absolute intellectual conformity. I think that's right. Uh, there's a book that came out a couple of years ago by uh, two self-identified conservative professors who pretty much laid out a manual for how to survive as a conservative. And it was, it was a really demoralizing book. They they seemed to think it wasn't really all that big a deal, but it's basically uh, hide your views until you get tenure. Um, uh, try to make friends with liberals, which of course is good advice for anyone. Um, and, and just try to get by. Uh, and, uh, and they basically tried to say there are some places where you can probably be a, uh, yourself, maybe in an economics department, but it, it was pretty much a recipe for staying in the closet. And uh, I don't think there's really anybody else on campus who would be told you must stay in the closet until this uh, unforeseen safe time for you to actually share your views, to even promote uh, intellectual diversity in class. Uh, just just trying to promote debate in class, as we've seen with so many professors, is something that can get them investigated by a uh, bias response team, by their department. Um, and these investigations can drag out for a year or two with really no resolution. And so the result of it is simply shut your mouth. I just think that's a very brilliant analogy coming out of the closet. That's become this defining moment for all sorts of non-traditional people to express themselves, become part of society. Even as we're, dra we're allowing people, encouraging people to leap out of the closet and be who they are, we're driving conservative voices into closets. And, and what this tells me is there's still a lot of skeletons in, closet, uh, in closets, particularly at places like Duke University. We've seen Professor Charney, Professor Griffiths, and a number of other people not withstanding the Duke lacrosse team who've been left out to dry by that particular university. Yeah, there are a lot more there. There's always material for us to cover at the College Fix because this kind of thing happens. Uh, the, the interesting thing about it is that we keep getting more access to primary documents, to email documentation, to litigation. Uh, I, I think a lot of this was hidden for a long time simply because it wasn't easily accessible. But uh, we're seeing a lot more of this, and especially people who are, are raising their voices now. They're realizing this isn't going to be better as long as I'm silent. I should probably look for some allies now who can put some pressure on my institution and, uh, and maybe get some people on my side who can make this more painful for the school to kind of drag out and actually resolve and let me do my thing. And that shows you how absolutely the College Fix is the right organization at the right time to bring this news to mom and dad and people who are going to college all across the world. Uh, be sure to stay up on all the latest news and information from the College Fix editors by joining us on all of our social media platforms. Greg Piper, it is always a pleasure to speak with you. I think one of the reasons why I've lasted as long in academia as I have, given my rather outspoken view, which is not very popular on college campuses, a view that challenges liberal progressive orthodoxy, I think one of the reasons that I've survived, and I, not to say that I haven't had my battles, I certainly have, but survival for me has been able to ignore campus politics, ignore the stupidity of faculty meetings, ignore the intellectual monolith that is a typical university campus, walk into my classroom, close the door, and teach as I see fit. But as we see in the stories we recorded today, and across the country actually, it's becoming harder and harder and harder to have any opinion in a classroom that deviates from the progressive orthodoxy. Critical thinking is a thing of the past. What we want is conformist thinking. Just a piece of advice to all you out there in the universities who think that this kind of control, this kind of oversight, this kind of Orwellian in, uh, imposition into what people can and can't say on college campuses, particularly in the classroom, it's not doing you any favors. I can tell you for a fact that I have many liberal students that come through my classrooms, and the one thing they tell me again and again and again is, you know, Pesta, I don't always agree with you. I'm not sure I see things the way you do, but it is really fascinating and interesting to have seen it, to have heard it. 
Uh, what we know, these liberal kids, all they know is straw, is conservative straw men. All they know is this hyperbolic cartoon caricature of conservative ideas. So in real life, when they're actually confronted by a smart conservative idea, they're embarrassed not to have answers. If you really want better trained, better educated, better argumentative conservative liberals, excuse me, if you want that, then put them in front of real conservatives. Let other people, other voices have a shot at it. If you're right that the only valid way of seeing the world is through liberal lenses, that will be doubled down by, a le by letting conservatives talk to kids freely. Uh, and if it's not really right, if you're worried that the more kids hear conservative philosophy and ideology, the more conservative they're going to become, well, then maybe you're in the wrong business. And that's The Final Fix. I'm Dr. Duke, and we will see you next time. For more videos and original articles, visit thecollegefix.com. And don't forget to like The College Fix on Facebook and follow on Twitter to receive your daily dose of right-minded news and commentary from across the nation.